it doesn't work, I'll just call it a practice for uh, <laughs> an actual review. <laughs> well, like you said, I have no idea if this is going to work. I have no clue if my head's even in frame because I'm looking at the car while the I'm driving. The picture always expands. Oh, okay. So it's not even really going to matter. The worst case scenario, oh, I have to adjust the lighting because I really had to adjust the shit out of the lighting for Jackass because... Mm. Can't have your light on while Did you're driving. Did that go up? Car. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's been up for months. I haven't even seen it. <laughs> well, this has been a nice intro. What's going on, guys? I'm Tyler. Oh hey, I'm Josh. And we are here to let you know that the Northman is no perfect movie, but um, fuck, is it a brutal one at that? A lot of blood. A lot of blood. And the plot is basically Hamlet or Lion King, but with Vikings. You have Amleth, played by Alexander Skarsgård, who as a child is a Viking prince and heir to the throne until his father is murdered by his uncle Fjornur, played by Kleis Biang. I have no idea how to pronounce some of these Pretty names. Pretty good in the movie. I've never heard of him, though. Yeah, me maybe neither. He on, uh, maybe he was on that Viking show. Who knows? It could be. I mean, some of them wouldn't surprise me. Needless to say, he uh, runs off to safety, grows up to become an incredibly brutal and vengeful warrior as he sneaks off to his former homeland in the hopes of avenging Fjolnir and hopefully rescuing his mother queen, played by Nicole Kidman. So, how much did you know about this movie going in? Absolutely nothing. My knowledge was... We were going to see a movie, and I was off, and I had seen the poster, and they were like, huh, that looks like some, I don't know, some epic, I don't know, I guess, uh... I'm just glad that you had time, you had time to make this double feature, so, uh, before this, Josh, I, and a couple other friends saw The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, and then this, which is quite polar opposite, when a massive talent is this upbeat meta comedy that is a little bit smarter than people might give it credit wow, for at first. So. And then you got brilliant. this, which is absolutely dredged in a terrifying atmosphere, which is right up of uh, Robert Eggers' alley, given that he already made The Witch and The Lighthouse, which are movies that I liked. I didn't fall in love with them like most people did. I uh, I, did, I saw The Witch a long time ago. I saw the witch when it um, came out. I don't first remember much. Um, there specific... And then I saw the lighthouse, and I liked the poster a lot. The lighthouse does have a really good poster. Great poster. And going in, like I knew Eggers' filmography had gotten better because I liked the witch but didn't love it, and then I liked the lighthouse a lot more. But also felt that you had to be a little too big of a mythology nerd in order to fully appreciate some of the twists that happens. Oh, that's fair. But with this movie, one of the great things is you don't have to be well-versed in what it means to be a Viking or Scandinavian myths in order to understand what's going on. Hell, you don't even have to know that this is Hamlet or Lion King, essentially, when you get down to it story-wise, because Hamlet is obviously Hamlet, no real shocker there. Anya Taylor-Joy as this one sorceress is kind of Ophelia. Uh, Fjolnir is Claudius. Nicole Kidman is kind of Gertrude been a while since I've read Hamlet, so... It's one of the only Shakespearean plays I really remember. I was in that. In, uh, we did that. We did that in high school for the Sears drama. I did... That was, that was some minor role. I don't know, like, Lennox? Or so. I have no clue. I think, that's, like the, I think that's from Hamlet. Yeah, I was an open-based source operating system. I was thrilled. <laughs> but, um... I gotta say, when I heard that Eggers was given like $70 million from a big budget studio to essentially make an A24 hard R action movie, I got so excited that like with most trailers nowadays, I just completely closed my eyes during the trailer, just listened, anticipated what could possibly happen, and this delivered in spades. There were so many sequences where I was like dead still or kind of jittering back and forth to the point where I felt like I had whiplash multiple times throughout this movie. Yeah, I saw you jump at some certain points. You were just jumping or like, you know, you reacted to the different sequences that were taking place within the film. Yeah, because um, Eggers yeah. is really good at combining visuals and sound to create this incredibly weird and trippy, surreal vision. And he does a couple new techniques that I haven't seen from him where there are a lot of back and forth POV shots between characters who are either at odds with one another or kind of to establish a power dominance. Kind of like how Willem Dafoe and Ethan Hawke very early on are staring down Hamlet as a young boy going through this insane, fucked up ritual. If I did that as a kid, oh my goodness, I would not be alright. That 
is bizarre in that it feels like a long take, given how they keep uh, cutting, they keep combining all of these free 60 shots in order to make it feel like it's absolutely tangible. And what's insane is that there are a lot of sequences in this movie that are just done in long takes, but are kind of filmed in a no, Spielberg long take style where they kind of break each, sh each um, camera move into multiple compositions so that for any regular audience member who's just there to have a good time, they're going to think that it cut away or something like that. Yeah, that's that. true. That, old, that ritual bit there at the beginning, spoilers ahead, everybody, um, it reminds me of like a super tripped out horror version of that 70s show. <laughs> there are a couple of 360 circle sequences. Yep. In fact, I asked really... a guy on Letterboxd, uh, would it, this be a good movie to watch high? And he said that it would definitely elevate certain sequences. It might terrify you more. <laughs> it probably would terrify it would you would more. Terrify I'm you pretty more. glad that I saw this sober, but when I do go back, because there is so much that happens within the foreground and background, given the fact that these are long takes, there are so many other brutalistic moments that definitely would hit harder upon a second viewing. Because the action sequences are even more impressive because the majority of them are done in long takes. And I gotta say, might be a hot take on this one, but the long takes in this put the long takes in Revenant to shame with some of the stunts that they're able to accomplish. I'm gonna be honest, I saw the Revenant in theaters and was, and was really impressed by a lot of aspects of it. But on rewatch, it didn't really blow me away. I think it was more a theatrical experience. I kind of had First a... off the bat, and the second time it was still good. I just feel like Leo was reaching for an Oscar a little too hard. It did have a couple moments upon rewatch where it did feel a little too slow and a little too repetitive. And a part of me wonders if that might happen when I go rewatch re this movie. But one of the first action sequences is uh, a guy who catches a spear and then throws it back in the guy and kills him all within one shot. And the weird thing is the cut doesn't stop there. It shows a guy climbing yeah. up a wall with axes and then just hacking people to death. There are so many times where people get beheaded while they're talking or while they're moving. And the special effects yeah. in this are so seamless and well put together. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in this sequence. And while I liked us focusing on this character years later as it's the, the uh, kid from the Prophecy who, uh, who watched that unfortunate incident. Yeah. Um, I do think that we would have benefited from one wide shot of everyone climbing the wall, then going in closer. Uh, but that's my only, I, I just think like a little, I know we're supposed to focus on him and that's, his journey through the battle. That's kind of why I let it slide. Like, yeah, don't get me wrong. Like there's so one many... wide. That's all we would need to establish it. Yeah, there was a lot of violence that just breezes by. Mm, that throat rip was wonderful. Oh, yeah, there are sequences with a throat and a nose that are just unbelievable. Yeah. And there's one sequence involving Eyeballs. locking people into this one home and burning it, where the mm. camera keeps going that was tragic. back and forth, just showing one fucked up uh, kill after another massacre. Yeah, there was a lot in that sequence, because I was like, okay, this must be the younger kid. And that I was sequence like, was I was worth... super excited to see him do all that violence, but then I was seeing the other people around him, and when they put all the kids there, you know, that made me shed a tear. Like, so yeah. they were evoking multiple emotions I was throughout this. Because I was like, yeah, go kill him. And then I was like, oh, maybe don't do that exactly. <laughs> and the great thing about that fight sequence, it establishes the fact that while the, there is one particular member of these brutes that we're supposed to root for, yeah, he has a dark side. He has committed actions that are, yeah. by our definition, completely irredeemable. Yeah, that's some bear shit if I ever saw some. Yeah, and um, <laughs> I saw a behind-the-scenes feature of this before another movie a week or two ago. Oh, spoilers Where they were talking there. about how... No, no, no. Nothing, ma nothing major. Oh, okay. They were talking about the costume design in particular. Oh, okay. Which, the costume and the set design... You mean lack of costume. There's a, they just don't wear clothes sometimes. <laughs> there are plenty of sequences where, as per the mythology and the culture of this particular era, which isn't even like a thousand A.D., they're, they stick 110% to the culture where they do so many primal animalistic feats as part mm -hmm. of their religion, as per these rituals, that yeah. if this was done by any other director or if it was done in a mainstream way where there would be this uh, musical score playing in the background that was slowly building up, or as you put it, it would be perfectly lit, it would just be comical. Yeah, the, the whole movie rides, the story itself 
is a very decent story throughout from point A to point B. And I'm one to say that because I've never been a big Shakespeare fan, but I think it works in mythology fit in mythology and historical figures. Yeah. As opposed to people love the Lion King. I don't think it works as well in the Lion King as it works well in the Northman. But without the sound design and the incredible score, I think this music completely falls apart. You need that technical prowess to make this work. Now, don't get me wrong. Music is part of the ritual, but it comes from within this environment of people banging on drums, mm -hmm. banging swords on their shields as they're yeah. preparing for battle or preparing to ascend to a higher up ranking of a warrior. Like the costumes, the very opening sequence as per this tribe that Amleth has integrated in, some of them wear either wolves or bear fur, depending mm -hmm. on their mm -hmm. status. But he's wearing like one head that's one animal and fur that's another yeah. to show that he hasn't really matured. He hasn't technically come of age yet because his father's tragic murderer has really prevented him from seeing anything other than brutal revenge. Yeah, that um, that revenge path we get set on and the, uh, the tree of the kings is very important to the film. Absolutely, but I think it's more interesting um, after we got that fight because there's no interaction and I was curious about this and I didn't know what you thought. There's no interaction between him and anyone else. The one guy just says, hey, you're a great fighter. We're glad you found you as a kid. And that's pretty much it. And then we just see him leave this this whole setup that we have. Yeah, and I, was, um... I, I would like to see a little more from that setup. Here's but my here's my issue maybe it's though. We didn't. They did teach him his philosophy, but they didn't really teach him how to be among among other people. Because mm. like in that opening sequence where we see him with this tribe, he's really the only one who doesn't react to the violence the exact mm -hmm. same way that they do. Like they were born at the bottom of the food chain and have had yeah. to work their way up. He was born in royalty. He has mm -hmm. seen people really close knit. He's seen what he perceives to be healthy, stable relationships. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, for yeah. sure. And then he goes off to be a slave. That's where we get to see him. <laughs> he does disguise himself as a slave throughout the majority of the movie, which works mm -hmm. to his advantage. But the one thing I thought, after he saw that brutal violence, I don't think, like, usually in a film when someone, like, brands someone with a stick, like, that usually goes, oh, but after we saw all that, I was like, oh, yeah, this is normal. Yeah, like it, dude, normal, is, dude is unbelievable. Yeah. Has incredible stamina, physical endurance. Like, the film in the first twenty minute normalizes you to what type of violence you're going to see, what type of body horror, what type of this and that, and it does a good job of taking away the shock of it and then getting you into the story. And I think that's one of the aspects to be admired of the film. Honestly, one of the greatest qualities I had is that the just the brutality of the violence never goes away. The shock is always there you're just surprised by how many imaginative mm -hmm. creative ways yeah. they could come to completely dismember the shit out of yeah because like he gets to where he needs to go and he finds the person he needs to find and he he then finds the, the magical MacGuffin that he needs to find in the magical cave because yeah. take this it's dangerous to go alone this this really unique weapon that i think is is quite fascinating um the moonlight sword which is great and he has to fight like a demon but that. did you notice like he's standing in the moonlight but like he fought but he never moved because we go over to him picking up the sword you know yeah like, i thought that was a really unique aspect but yeah there's this really great fight sequence good. that also kind of turns out to be a dream and yeah. i won't spoil what it is because thematically it does tie into the story mm. and it does tie into amleth's journey and it was bookended in this fantastic mm. shot where it pans from the dream into reality like it was absolutely nothing yeah like, it was amazing it was effortless in that I can and, only, uh, I yeah. can't imagine how many takes they had to do just to like digitally put everything together. Like there mm -hmm. are so many times where characters just appear out of nowhere, even though the camera yeah. hasn't moved or it'll pan over as the character is disappearing. And more than likely that was where they had to mask the cut. But with everything that was going on, like the incredibly distorted sound design where it is kind of an easy way to uh, make some make an audience member unsettled or scared by mm. having like two versions of someone's voice. That's true. But because because these characters have never experienced supernatural shit like this before, and the magical people in this movie cannot just snap a finger and something will happen. They need the elements around them in order to make these magical events it, happen. Yeah, and I, I think one of the strengths also of this film is how simple it is. Yeah, the like, revenge story yeah, is incredibly simple. Here's a dude, 
He has to get revenge. The only way to get revenge is to use magical MacGuffin, and he has to do it at certain times. They're very creative with that, and he has to do the final fight. And it, it's not overly complicated, and there's not a lot of side plots, and it's simple, basic, point A to point B. There's a couple minor twists and turns in there, which, um, but I just, there's one scene that bothered me a little bit. Nicole Kidman's accent in the very first scene was awful. <laughs> Like the, I didn't notice. Like the very first scene, it sounded like she was hitting puberty and cracking in Irish. It just, it, and then it settled out. It just, it didn't work in that very first scene when we heard her talk. When you mean the very first scene, you mean like before, before the yeah. king's death? Before the king's death. Like okay. her accent in that scene just, I don't know what See, happened. That I don't particularly care about just because there is that passage of time. Not to mention, Nicole Kimmon, despite a lot of people calling her a standout performance, it takes a really long time for her to really stand yeah. out. Now, don't get me wrong. When she does reveal the type of character that she is, not gonna lie, I did kind of see that char character parallel coming. I figured coming. something had to come of that. She just sort of because is like a damsel they mention off screen, and then they're like, oh, now we give you something to do. Like, that's, that's sort of what her character is. But her motivation was something that, honestly, I wouldn't have thought of. Mm. And I can't really explain why, but... I don't think the movie wants you to know why. Well, I mean, she does have that terrific monologue where, without spoiling the circumstances, she and Amleth are face-to-face, -face, and she explains a side of her past that Amleth had absolutely no prior history of that really questions mm -hmm. whether or not his path of vengeance is the right move, or if this is the right move, is it for the exact reasons that he's been mm -hmm. led to believe? And before we forget, Alexander Skarsgård is Amleth. Oh, that's him. Fucking okay. Phenomenal. I couldn't figure out who that was in the movie. I was just like, well, he's got a beard. <laughs> well, everybody's made the same joke that this movie is called The Northman, and he was Eric Northman in True Blood. Oh, And also see, I didn't know happened that. to be a Viking before his transformation mm. as a vampire. So, like, the jokes really write themselves on this. But dude surprised the hell out of me in that he had to give a ton of his performance without saying a single word whatsoever, and half the time mm -hmm. giving the exact same facial expression but minor subtle details like the inflection in his eyes or his body posture because there are some sequences where he moves the story forward while the camera is from behind and we don't actually even see his as face. he states it best he will annoy them to death he is and that really leads me into probably my favorite quality about amleth and his past for vengeance he's unbelievably patient and yep. cunning with all the time that has spent between his father's murder and his path towards revenge, he has had plenty of time to think about mm. just every single little detail. There was a moment where he can escape being a fake slave and grab a knife, but he takes that opportunity to spy on other people, learn mm -hmm. their strengths and weaknesses so that he can psychologically manipulate yeah. before hacking them to death. Well, see, that's what I, I, I draw a lot of parallels to the Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, absolutely. Because it's the slow burn revenge where he look, gains his trust and then they... It's very similar in conception to it, but very heavily rooted in the Viking mythology. Yeah, this this movie it makes it abundantly clear that this is a story we've heard a thousand yeah. times before. It's not the complexity of the characters mm -hmm. or the story. It's the atmosphere that these characters live in that make even the minor, most pointless moments feel mm -hmm. so riveting. Even in the small amount of time that they have, Ethan Hawke really stands out. Who is Ethan Hawke? <laughs> Ethan Hawke was the king that gets murdered. Oh! You didn't notice? I, I, they all have beards. He has his beard, but he puts on this great accent that even yeah, at I didn't his know it was Ethan Hawke. Even at his most compassionate, he sounds like a menacing individual, and that part really sells the fact that he was a capable ruler, while also hmm. establishing some minor secrets that tie into Nicole Kidman's backstory that actually explain a fair bit, and it makes you look at the first twenty minutes a lot different. Yeah, I like how the first twenty minutes of the film gives us backstory gives us where he is now and says okay just follow the story now there's no like flashbacks there's no like odd Thank editing to, there's no like where he leans down on a sword and he like there's like maybe 10 seconds where he thinks of his past and that's when he's like clutching the sword for the first time because it like has a prophecy ability and, and i think they really do well by setting it all in the present as opposed to doing a lot of flashbacks what i do some like films that can it rely was, on i do like that it was chronological yeah and i i, I think 
for, I think that's the strength, another strength of the film is because with a lot of mythology, people won't understand it if the film is jumping around back and forth in timelines. So they simplified the story, made it in order, and then they can use the complicated mythology and the complicated ceremonies and witches and destiny and fates. And that way, any average person walking in would still understand it and not be confused. Because imagine if it was edited yeah. out of order and we get the thing in the middle, people would be like, what's happening, you know, to the average viewer? I can see a lot of disappointed, like, 40-something moms going in thinking they're going to see a lot of abs and then they see blood and guts. <laughs> yeah, that really makes me wonder whether or not my mom can sit through this because she's actually really excited to check this out. It's a lot of abs. If you're into that thing, they got you covered. There are abs. Um, I don't think that's going to cut it for her. Yeah, because I think, um, like, a some of the violence may scare some mothers. Yeah, which, don't get me wrong, it wasn't as brutal as I thought it was going to be, just because when someone does get hacked, yeah. it moves on to the next person, but the kill is so dark but, that just within an instant. Like, but there's the, a sequence yeah. where there are mutilated bodies yep. and limbs on a building, and it's only in the frame for a couple seconds, but it's enough. Yeah, yeah, I mean, can you imagine him at night, like, trying to do that with the sword this part goes here. <laughs> He's yeah, like, it's and, like a puzzle. I'll get it eventually. Where's the miss? Oh, it's right over here. Yeah, and the prelude to that, the fighting is done in the dark to make you wonder, yep. what is this guy going to do? And how is he going to be able to hide it while still presenting himself? But to its, its credit, save? in the dark, you can still see what's happening. Because it's not like the end of Hulk. And it's not like the season eight of Game of Thrones. You can actually see what's happening in the dark. There's enough firelight. There's enough... Um, reaction shots of everything. And for every time there is a brutal kill on screen, the next one is a reaction shot. So your brain is filling in that gap. So that's really good action editing right there. That's a problem I had with The Witch and The Lighthouse. Oh, there were some okay. sequences, in The Witch especially, because everything was brown or grayscale. And don't get me wrong, there's tons of gray and blue scale within yeah. this movie. But it knows how much natural light to yeah. add to the sequence where there are lots of shadows and among many other details, and, but you yeah. can still see it. With and, the witch, the brown scale just... During the witch sequences, I had no idea what was even happening. Mm. And in the lighthouse, it's technically a little easier to comprehend because it's just black and white. Yeah. But at the same time, the environment blends in with the aspect ratio bars that yeah. sometimes it can still look a little too Yeah, see, that was one of my gripes with the film. The red exit sign kept reflecting on the corner of the screen, and we got a little ah. bit of red in there. I did not like that. I think they should have toned See, that down. During this movie, there was like, you can't fix the lights in between the stairs and the seats. No, you don't need like to. That, that I can look away from, which but there's just red light on the screen matter. for the like, exit sign. Which didn't matter. Like, we walked in just as this movie was starting. Yeah, I, was, I couldn't yeah. see the seat numbers. We were sitting, we were, I was waiting to get some pizza. Um, there was a long line because all I'm the kids. I'm not complaining. I'm not the, complaining. And all the families were having a great time. Um, uh, everyone was going to see, what is that, Bad Guys movie, I'm guessing? They were all there to a lot see of families. Sonic or So, yeah, guys. one of the kids' movies. And that's okay. We just, you know, we were waiting in line for a little bit there. But yeah. um, I will give it credit. The way, like, the way it edited. So you see the man get his hand chopped off. And then you see off-screen a man about to stab a knife in his neck. And you just see the reaction. And then the big, there's a big finale scene near the end um, where a couple of the characters are fighting our character. And you see the certain character gets stabbed in the chest, but the next kill happens with his reaction. So the balance between the editing of here's the gore, here's the reaction is very well done. Oh, absolutely. And it definitely helps that ev nearly everything within the frame is real. There yep. are like 90% of this movie is on practical sets and in real life locations in the majority of this movie was filmed in Ireland, and mm. I think that had mostly to do with COVID protocols, if I had to Did you guess. notice the one detail that I really loved about the stars in the sky? Do tell. So every time they showed the sky and he was killing someone with the magic sword, the stars would black out for a brief second. Really? Yes. Huh. So if he was doing a kill and you heard a scream or there's a blood gush, the stars would just disappear very subtly or fade for a split second. I thought that was a really, really neat detail. That's really interesting. I mean, as sort of because the sword is otherworldly and it's sorcery and death, and it's definitely not magic of this world. They state that in the film. Yeah. So I think that for it to black out the world temporarily to fulfill its mission is a very interesting concept and a small detail that I think works well with the film. Oh, for sure. I mean, the musical score was mm. just 
palpable. Yeah. And very minimal, minimalist. There are a lot of just beating drums or Ominous beating... tones. Yeah. Like, a good ominous tone can be used well or used very poorly. Yeah, the finale has this mm -hmm. fantastic or orchestra yeah. combined with this choir of men who are just brutally shouting these war cries. And I gotta say, these actors make the most animalistic of yeah. grunts and screams completely yeah. fear-inducing. Like, I actually got shivers just hearing <laughs> Alexander um, Skarsgård yeah. basically do a Nicolas Cage scream just going, Oh! Did you notice during the final fight with our, our hero, Omelette, or Omelette, or whatever his name is, Yeah. Um, they mixed, they were really clever in what they were doing. And what they did was when he was screaming near the end for one of the final moments um, in the fight, they mixed his scream from the younger child with the older child. That I didn't catch that because... And I was like, oh, that's brilliant. That's good. That's I, good sound design. I completely missed that because when he was starting to vow his revenge as an adult, um, as in as he starts chanting it over and over again, this very clear sky completely disappears and smoke comes in from behind him and completely mm -hmm. drowns him out. And the fight, the finale of this movie very fittingly takes place on top of a volcano to definitely serve as a metaphor yeah. for hell and the fact that revenge with all the pleasure initially that it may present will not solve anything and will not make your life happier. And without spoiling any anything, once again, Fjolnir actually has a set of revenge motivations for Amleth that tie mm. into the manipulation and mind tricks that he plays. See, but during that final sequence, I couldn't help but think, because Alex Yannisgardar just looked exactly like Obi-Wan, and when he was kneeling in the lava, he's like, oh, you were I can think say, of one. You got... were the chosen one! You were supposed... I just couldn't help it and See, thinking of that. I thought you were going to say, I've got the high ground. No, like, you were the chosen one, like that that epic Star Wars music. Like, I couldn't help but think of that. And but... I know they weren't inciting that, but and I think they did it better than Episode 3, for sure, because Episode 3 was a little cheesy and overly long and CG. But like that, my brain was thinking of that. Yeah, well, <laughs> it definitely helps that the action sequences, because almost every scene in this movie is done in a long take. There yeah. are no cuts. There are no moments of shaky. Cam there are definitely cuts. Whatsoever. We just don't see them because they're cleverly hidden. They're cuts, but they don't happen upon impact. Yeah. It's just to change the perspective of where Amleth go is going and who he is going to kill. It reminds me a lot of the ed editing in Braveheart. If, okay. Like, because it's got long shots, it's got brutal violence, it's got reaction shots. But I think it's done a little better because there's not that overdramatic music that Braveheart and a lot of 90s movies and James Newton Howard scores can have. They can be really dramatic at points. Like, the score when they then they do the May Take Our Freedom or whatever. Yeah. Very dramatic. Is it a bad moment? No, but it's dramatic for sure. And I think the, the subtleties of the score um, is definitely a strength at points. I totally agree. And the interesting thing is every performance, no matter how small it is, 100% stands out. This was apparently Bjork's first role in a movie or show in like 15 plus years. And I'm not 100% sure which character she plays. If I'm right, I'm, not sure. I'm pretty sure she's this First Nations looking individual who's kind of here. a prophet. But through mostly through the makeup but also through her soft but still slimy and threatening line delivery Let's see. sets Amleth on this path in a way that feels very unappealing but still very necessary yeah it is that's her okay yeah and uh for only having three scenes, Willem Dafoe owns every yeah. single one of them. But what film has o William Dafoe never owned? He's a character actor. He comes in, he does a few scenes. That's what William Dafoe does. He's taken the place of Gary Oldman as the character actor. Because Gary that's Oldman true. hasn't done a lot lately. And not that anything he's done has been bad. I don't think I remember anything he's done lately at all. No, but like, even he has to put on this facade where everyone thinks that he's a court jester, and then yeah. it turns out that he does something a little more, um... A little more risque there. Risque doesn't even put it mildly. 
And there was one moment where we see this corpse, and I thought that he was going to reanimate it. Yeah, I which, thought it was going to come alive, too. I was like, it's like, got to come alive. And Akers is really good with uh, playing with our expectations on what this yeah. magic or what this mythology is supposed to set out to do. There's a sequence revolving around a portal leading to Valhalla and a Valkyrie that just looked unbelievable. And maybe y'all can help me out. Why does Valkyrie have braces? Is that a thing? <laughs> I don't remember that. Um, See, when I saw that in the trailer, I thought, when I saw it in like a five seconds when I did look up, I thought that I was imagining something. Like, Valkyrie's got braces. I don't know if they're like a warrior symbol. I don't know if they're full yeah, braces. I don't, I don't know if they're like a teeth strengthener for battle because you get your teeth knocked. I don't know what's going on with that. That does lead me to the one problem that I have. I would have liked a lot more of Anya Taylor-Joy mm. as this um, seer who has the ability to and does help Amleth a little bit. She's actually really good in this. I, I oh, really started wrong. to appreciate I her. I loved her in this. Because, uh, I mean, when Queen's Gambit came out, like, I thought the first few episodes were fine. I thought she was okay. But, like, last night in Soho, I'm like, oh, she's good. Oh, she's And then this, this was like, and then I saw this. And I'm like, oh, I get, if you give her the right role, she's phenomenal. I just hadn't seen her play the right role yet. And like, between, not that Queen's Gambit is bad, I just don't think she was given a ton to work with. Well, between The Witch and this, I do prefer, I do prefer this performance because they're out of all the characters, she's probably the most complex in that she has all of these magical mm. abilities, but she doesn't use them until the absolute right moment. Mm -hmm. And right from the beginning, she can tell that Amleth is not a real slave, but there's this higher purpose for him. And what I like is that normally when the man and the woman, who we all know are going to get together and fall in love, they start off hating each other and slowly build a rapport. But that doesn't happen. The two of them are survivors. They know that beggars can't be choosers and that they instantly commit once they realize that they have a shared motivation mm. and they have shared goals that can help each other out. Yeah. But good movie. The, good movie. I absolutely yeah. love The Northman. It's a toss-up between this and The Batman. I would much prefer watching The Batman, but... Uh, mm. I'll take Death on the Nile. Love that movie. <sighs> Shocker. But I like Death on the Nile, The Unbearable, the, unbe the Nicolas Cage one we saw today. Those are my two favorite of the year. The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent so much was fun. awesome. Favorite and of the year. And like the, t the next time we uh, get the chance, we're going to have to review this oh, together. Oh, that was cause... a blast. Honestly, if you can and you've seen any Nicolas Cage movie or know who he is personally-wise... Go see this movie. You'll have a blast. It's it, just a lot of fun. Absolutely. Look forward to an unbearable weight review. Yeah. The Mandalorian it'll pays him a million dollars to go to an island. It'll take <laughs> it'll take a week or so, but yeah, it'll we'll be worth it. it. We promise. We've got a few tricks up our sleeve for the video. Oh, we do. I'll have to come up don't with forget some tricks. What I, don't forget what I told you about. Don't spoil it. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a long week. I forgot about that. <laughs> You're not the only one who's worked 60 hours, man. But regardless, yeah. I'm going to give the Northman a 4.5 out of 5. Please go That's support really good. this movie. It has a massive scope. It has beautifully brutal cinematography, terrific action sequences. When they're there, this is not an action-heavy movie by any means, but, but the, the choreography it it and the uncompromising violence when it happens makes it all the more worth it, and it will give you goosebumps and whiplash. The performances, all top-notch. Even five-minute cameos make a huge impact on the story and leave a trace. So you're going to see this in D-Box so when the violence happens at the scene? No, I'm going to look for an IMAX screening that's not, <laughs> oh, a fair enough. that's not a quarter to ten in the middle of the fucking night. That was the only <laughs> IMAX screening at that theater and I'm just like, hell no. You know what they got in IMAX? The secrets of Mr. Dumbledore. That's why the Northman's not there. What secrets? Like you edited it out the secrets so, well, that, you you could know, put, so that you could put your movie in China. Fuck you, Warner Brothers. Have you, have you seen the uh, the uh, pitch meeting for that? It's great. I'm going to have to check it out once again. It's get out of this fantastic. Car. Yeah. But, uh, guys, thanks as always for watching. If you have seen The Northman, let us know in the comments below what you thought of it. Thank you so much for joining me on this. If you this. have seen North and South with Patrick Swayze, let you know what we thought of it. Feel free to check out Josh's other channels in the description below. We got. Uh, PB &J. He's got Joy! He's got PBJ, which is a yeah. sketch comedy uh, series. You got. Uh, his regular channel, yeah, which is the two, and two of us. Definitely time check is, it out. Yeah, time is hard. Stay tuned for more <laughs> reviews, and be sure to like and subscribe. Yes. Take care. Cool.